Today on The Spirit Contemporary Life. We should know the presence and the power of God in a very special way. If not, there's something wrong. And it's not wrong on God's side. I'm so glad you decided to join me today. You've probably heard me talk a lot about the spirit contemporary life, which is about what the Christian life should look like as a believer in today's world. Through this TV program, I want to show you that the spirit contemporary life can be one filled with love, peace, joy, prosperity, healing, and so much more. In John 10, 10, it says Jesus came so you could have life and have it to the full. I truly believe that God's got a special plan for each and every person watching today. You've got a unique gifting, a calling on your life. If you can learn to be fully connected to the Spirit of God and be relevant, be cool, be contemporary, you'll be so effective then in impacting others for the kingdom. You can experience the spirit contemporary life. So listen closely, take some notes as we get into today's message. It's so good to have you with me today. We are on an amazing topic today about getting the miracle that you're believing God for. The Bible teaches us that receiving miracles, walking in the miraculous should be easy. It should be something that is regularly happening in our lives. If it's not regularly happening in your life, there is something that is holding it back. Because God's will is that you walk in power and blessing and when miracles are needed that they flow in our lives. I mean, the entire New Testament was filled with the miraculous. And so our world, our churches, our lives, our families, we should know the presence and the power of God in a very special way. If not, there's something wrong. And it's not wrong on God's side. And so that's what I want to talk about today. We'll see how far we can get through on this because over the last 30 years of ministering to people, being at the bedsides of those who have passed away, those who are getting miracles, I've learned a few things about helping people receive miracles, release miracles, activate miracles. Uh, and so I wanted to share some thoughts with you and we're gonna dive into God's word. Now, one of the things that I've noticed, remember, I'll tell you this story. I was with this woman one time and she was a grandma, uh, still had lots of great years left, but got sick and was dying and, and she was passing away and, and nothing that we did seemed to turn this, her life around and, and, and begin to heal up. It just slowly began to disintegrate until finally, before she passed away, she wanted to meet with me. Uh, and so the kids were out having coffee and she just let me know. She goes, thank you, pastor, so much for praying with me and uh, for being there for my kids. And I know I'm going to heaven, but she goes, I really wasn't expecting a miracle. She goes, I know that when I was a young girl, I had an abortion. And she goes, you know, this is just, and, and she, I forget the exact words she used, but she used words meaning kind of like what I expect. I'm, I'm kind of reaping what I sowed and I'm fine with that. She was smiling really big. I'm fine with that. I'm going to be with Jesus. Uh, but so thank you. And we talked for a while and I tried to show her in the word. She just kind of smiled at me, you know, as though she was kind of putting up with me and she went away, went to be with Jesus. Too soon, but she went to be with Jesus. And it made me realize more than ever that so many people, they can believe that God can forgive them and wash them clean and make heaven. Okay, they believe that, but they struggle with believing that they can get miracles on this planet. That's kind of ridiculous to think that you can be, you know, 
uh, forgiven and washed clean and become a brand new creation and go to heaven, but you probably won't see the miracles that you need here on this planet. And so I wanna show you what I tried to talk with her about and, and show you how if every time you're believing God for a miracle, your mind goes back to where you used to be. Or even as a Christian, you've committed a sin, you've done something wrong, and you know because of that, that you're not gonna see anything happen uh, as far as the miraculous, then I'm gonna show you how to deal with that. And so write these scriptures down, grab a, a pen or a paper. I'm gonna start out in 1 John chapter 3, 19 to 24. Here's what it says. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him, Jesus, in whatever our heart condemns us. For Here's what it says, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. All right, so it's saying here that God knows everything. He knows everything you've done wrong. He, he, he's not naive. And, and, and so he's saying here that we've got to assure our hearts. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask him, we receive. From him. It says that in whatever our hearts condemn us, our hearts will be assured in the area your heart condemns you. This lady had an abortion when she was younger and it had haunted her and she'd gotten victory over it and believed she was going to heaven, had raised a family, never told any of them about it. She didn't have to tell anyone about it. None of their business. Everyone keeps thinking you gotta confess your sins to everybody. And that's not what the Bible talks about when it says confess our sins one to the other. And it's talking there about when you're struggling with something and you can't uh, get free from it, talk to somebody. It's not talking about hey, go back into your past and tell everybody all the gory details. No, love covers a multitude of sins. But it says here that when your heart condemns you, it says that it's the truth that will assure your heart. For God is greater than our heart's condemnation. And he knows all things. Then it goes on to say, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask him, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Now people go right there, they go there. See, it was sounding good, but now I gotta keep all his commandments. No, it's not talking about the Old Testament's commandments. In fact, here's what it says. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. That's the commandment? Yeah, you don't find that in the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament. This new commandment says that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. This is the commandment. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. All through the New Testament, as the epistles, whenever we read about keeping his commandment, he's talking about this new commandment, which is to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, why do we believe in that name? Because then we believe that he's qualified us. All right, so this verse very clearly is telling us that if we want to walk in the miraculous, if we want to see miracles of health and prosperity and relationships and all the beautiful miracles that, that will help you in the breakthroughs, it says that your heart can't condemn you. Big issue, your heart can't condemn you. Now, what? let's go back to, in the Word of God, to Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5. It's prophesying here about Jesus and what he's going to do for us. It says, surely he has borne our griefs. In the Amplified, it says, sicknesses, weaknesses, distresses, and carried our sorrows and pains. Then it says, of punishment. Yet we ignorantly considered Jesus, him, stricken, smitten, afflicted by God as if with leprosy, but... He, he was wounded for our transgressions, our mistakes, sins, failures. He was bruised for our guilt. Why would we, why, why would we need to be dealt with with guilt? 
Because even after it's done and you've been forgiven, you can stay living in your guilt, always looking back in the past as to how bad you were and how evil you were and why did I do that? It says, but the chastisement needed to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him, Jesus. And with the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. This is teaching us that when this is prophesying of Jesus coming and that when he came, he was going to take our sicknesses and he was going to take our weaknesses, our distresses. And when he died on the cross for you, he died for sin. He took your guilt, your condemnation. He took this hauntedness that haunts you all the time, that every time you go to have someone pray for you, you kind of smile sweetly like that lady did on the bed before she died. She looked at me kind of sweetly and said, Oh, Pastor, you're just so wonderful. You've never given up on me. That kind of a thing. But she wouldn't allow God's Word to get inside of her heart because truth sets you free. And her own heart was condemning her. God did not hold the miracle back. In fact, the devil doesn't have the power to hold the miracle back except that he was the one lying in her ear all these years going, you had an abortion, you had an abortion, you had an abortion. You can't expect miracles. You're lucky to make heaven. This is just put up with this. And I don't know how many other things she put up with with this lie whispering in her ear, you committed this sin. It's in your past. You can get to heaven maybe, but you can't have the blessing of God in your life down here. I want you to know that Isaiah 53 shows us that he didn't just take our sins, but our guilt and our condemnation and the punishment that does go for our sins. Because in the Old Testament, whenever you sinned, there was a curse that came into your life. All right? But here it says, he took it. He was stricken, smitten, afflicted for us. It, everything you should have got, every uh, one of the things that should be, you should be punished with and the curse that should go on you, it went on Jesus. Now, when you understand this, this is the truth that assures your heart, brings peace to your heart, that I can walk in health and healing because of Jesus. I love telling this story, uh, and I've used it so many times because it helps many, many Christians. One time in a healing lineup, we had a new lady that had walked into our church, and she'd heard us talking about healing and miracles, and she came to the front and stood there with her head kind of down, and uh, then the lady beside her was one of our staunch volunteer involved in the church ladies, but kind of a little proud, a little bit, she was very proud and of her you know how good she was and how much she served and gave and everyone seemed to know what she did for our church. But I, before I pray for the first lady, I just told her, I'm going to pray for you. And you could tell, you could smell on her alcohol and tobacco and drugs. You could see on her face that she was worn and, and just a partier and just at the end of her rope, this young girl. So I just told her, I said, I'm going to pray for you. But you need to know that Jesus loves you and that when I pray for you, you don't have to earn it. It's just a gift. Would you be able to receive a gift from God if I prayed for you? And what she wanted was she had a horribly painful shoulder that she couldn't lift. Uh, she didn't tell me why she had it, but she couldn't even lift her arm. I said, could you receive just a gift from God and he'll heal you? And she goes, okay, knowing she couldn't earn it. She put her head down, I prayed. She said, put your arm up. She went like this, put her arm all the way up, and she was just blown away, gave her life to Jesus. And Then I went to pray for the next lady, this lady from our church, and, and uh, prayed for her, and she was assured she was going to get it because the next lady got it. And she had the same thing. She had a problem with her shoulder. And uh, so she couldn't put her, she tried it, she couldn't put it, the pain was all still there, and she walked away. And later on, uh, I heard her talking to a lady, and she talked to me as well, just letting us know that she just is offended. Now, she didn't say she was offended, but you could tell she was but that she was hurt, that you know, God had healed this little, and she didn't use the word tramp, but something like that. This little walks in here with her life all messed up and not serving Jesus, and here I am volunteering, I'm plugging in my entire life, and God doesn't heal me. She did not understand how miracles happen. You can't earn miracles through good behavior. Yes, volunteer, yes, give, tithe, give offerings, do all the beautiful things, but not to earn God's blessing. The first lady in line knew she could never earn them and just humbly received a gift. 
And the second lady was proud knowing that I'm going to get healed because I give and I tithe and I volunteer and this is my church. And that's the wrong thing. You can't have that pride in your heart. The Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The word grace means his unearned favors like healing, prosperity, blessing, peace, joy, etc. We've got to go back to being like little children if we're going to walk in faith, if we're going to walk in the power and the blessing of God. You know, if you've been believing God for something and not receiving it, you've begun to buy into a lot of lies that are out there. Like maybe God is allowing this because you deserve it from something you did wrong. Or you should have done more and you didn't do it. Or, or, or. And so we begin to blame God that he hasn't healed us yet. And one of the things you've got to remember is that whenever someone asks me, why didn't God heal me? Why didn't God rescue my business? Why didn't God touch my husband, my little one. I always know the second they say, why didn't God, I already know they don't understand the new covenant. Because in the new covenant, Peter teaches us in 2 Peter chapter 1, that he's already given us all things. So he's given us healing. So when you say, why didn't God heal my uh, daughter, husband, me? Why didn't God? He already did. The issue is not getting God to heal. The issue is the healing that is residing within you in Jesus, getting it released in your body. The Bible says that the same spirit in Romans 8 that, that raised up Christ's body from the dead. If that spirit, Holy Spirit, dwells in you, it will quicken your mortal body. So Holy Spirit within you is always quickening you. But the Bible teaches us that grace works by faith. So here's one of the things I do. I continually every day declare that the Spirit of God within me is radiating into my body and I have the mind of Christ. I have health and healing in every organ. I thank you, Father, my immune system is powerful and kills every disease, sickness, virus, bacteria. Thank you, Father, that the Spirit of Christ within me quickens my mortal body. And you see, one of the things that is better than needing a miracle is walking in health. Did you know the presence of God that is within you is there to keep you in health, not wait till you get down, 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 sick, 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 and all of a sudden you get cancer in something and disease in something and now you need a miracle. No, something greater than needing a miracle is walking in health, walking with your body energized with the life of Jesus. And so daily you need to confess with your mouth that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in my body and it quickens my mortal body. It quickens my liver in Jesus' name. It quickens my brain in the name of Jesus. It quickens my nerves and my nerve endings in Jesus' name. It, in any area that the enemy is attacking you or that you feel your body breaking down, you need to be confessing every day that the same spirit that raised Jesus' body, and by the way, his body was dead three days, rotting, and so everything was broken down. The cells were broken down. I mean, it, 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 he was stinking. It was, this body was not healthy. And the power of God literally rekindled life and healed every cell, every nerve ending, every bone, every ligament, every brain cell was healed. The spirit came back into it. And he, he was alive. So the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. So when you say, God, where are you? I need healing. He's, the healing's not in heaven. With Jesus, Jesus is seated positionally at the right hand of the Father, but he's in you. And therefore, you need to begin to change the way you think. Stop looking for as though God, Jesus has to come up from the dead or come down from heaven or come here from the church altar. He's always within you. And your confession needs to be that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead in Romans 8 dwells in me and it quickens me. I confess every day that my immune system is powerful and strong, kills every virus, kills every bacteria. It brings life and healing. My body is filled with healing and life and victory and I'm walking strong and I'm going to live. The Bible says with long life he'll satisfy me in Psalms 91 the last verse. And so I declare that every day that with long life God's going to satisfy me and I am going to live healthy, healed and whole. Moses was 120 and his eye hadn't dimmed or his natural forces abated. This, I'm walking in health and life to 120 and until I'm satisfied in the name of Jesus I have energy and you I'll just talk when I'm in the car, when I'm by myself. I begin to just to speak to my body, speak to my future, speak to my life. And I know, I know God will never allow sickness in my life. We've got to understand that God is not using sickness to teach you. 
He's not such a poor teacher that he has to allow cancer in or allow a death in my family in or allow my business to go bankrupt. Not a chance. In James 1.13, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted. Now, the word tempted means to move off track of God's best. You're tempted. We keep thinking tempted is just into drugs or sex. No, no. Tempted off of God's best. Tempted out of healing. Tempted out of protection. Tempted out of uh, the call on your life. Tempted out. And Satan will do anything. If you fall into sin, he'll still try to tempt you to make you believe that now you can't fulfill your ministry. Now you can't. And so no, when you're tempted, it says, let nobody say, I am being tempted by God. Because we think, well, God's allowing this temptation to try me and to test me and to see if I... No, God's word is how he teaches you and I. He doesn't need to use the devil. Although, you know, the, he, the Bible says that, well, the devil... Well, no, put it this way. The devil's kind of God's employee. He lets him go to work on you so that you can learn to use faith and be strong. That's just crazy. It says, for God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. Verse 17 says, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation, there's no changing, there's no shifting shadow. He's not moving into the shadows and letting something else come in. No, 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 no. Everything beautiful and good comes from God. And everything that's bad and wrong, believe it off. God's with you against it. He's with you against sickness. He's with you against uh, poverty. If you think God is allowing some disease to teach you something, then you will begin to believe that you can't get rid of it because God allowed it in. Take that thought a little further. If God allowed the disease in, why would you even see a doctor? You think a human doctor is going to stop a disease God's allowing in? God does not allow disease in. That is not, he's not using that. He's not using traumas, tragedies. Now, everything that you go through in life, God will cause it to work together for good. If you walk in faith, believe in grace. In his grace, he'll turn everything around. And what the devil meant for harm, you can walk in blessing and beauty. We've got to understand the truth of God's word. We must assure our hearts. Today, be assured that Jesus qualifies you for the miracle. Today, as I'm speaking, let your heart be at peace. If you've asked God to come into your heart, if Jesus had come into your heart to forgive you, that everything you've done wrong, from this point back, even the sins you committed as a Christian, those are gone, finished. Jesus died for them 2,000 years ago. You might say, well, Leon, that's for the sins before I got saved. No, every sin was in the future. Every sin you committed as a Christian, uh, he died for way back then 2,000 years ago. He wants you to walk in victory, yes, but he's not allowing sickness, disease into your life. The spirit of contemporary life means that you live an empowered life, one that connects your day-to-day -day existence with God's supernatural power. As Christians, we're to be the shining light in the world we live in. We are to stand out in our workplace as great employees, bosses, CEOs. Our relationships should flourish. Christians should and can be the best of the best. If this sounds good to you, and I encourage you to study your Bible and see what it really says about the Christian life. All of us need to start with our identity rooted in the Word. By practicing generosity, you're not only enriching your own life and putting action to your faith, but you're also changing the lives of others, those who need to hear about the saving grace of Jesus. Father, I pray right now, the power of God flowing in their life. I thank you that, Father, we don't are not governed by fear. I pray that you put on the heart of every person listening. Father, to partner with us, that together we can win souls for Jesus, bring healing and, and miracles to the masses around this planet. Father, touch them deeply with a sense of what they can do to bring this message to the world. Jesus' name, amen. All over the world, there are people who have not yet heard about the love of Christ, people who desperately need it. We all have an important part to play in sharing this message. God's given us his beautiful life to enjoy, but while you are living it, be very aware that the message you know that Jesus is the answer for the world today.
Reaching people with the gospel is the very heartbeat of this ministry. This is why we work so diligently to make our programs relevant and contemporary, translating hundreds of materials into French, Spanish, Mandarin, Russian, Farsi, and many more. Because of the generosity of partners like you, our programs have been able to reach millions, not only here at home, but also in South America, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. There is still so much work to do. We will not stand by idly because people's eternity lie in the balance. We need to act now. People need to hear about the love of Jesus and his amazing grace today. Together, we will share Jesus in a spirit contemporary way. And together, we will see miracles.